Welcome to the Christ Community Church Sermon of the Week. We are so glad that you've tuned in. It is our prayer that as we preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit would speak to you and that your eyes will be fixed on Jesus. We hope you enjoy. Our scripture reader this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning at verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assembled together against the Lord and against the Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. All right. Good morning, Christ Community Church. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Um, Well, if we've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Josh, and I get the honor and privilege of being the senior pastor here at Christ Community Church, and I am excited because Jesus, the light of the world, is with us today, and he's going to continue to be with us as we dive verse by verse through his word today. But uh, if you are new here, or maybe you've been coming for a little while and you've not quite yet got connected, we would love to know that you were here, and a great next step for you is if you did not fill out the digital connect card with the QR code before service, Uh, We ask that after service, after our gathering, you stop out at the connection desk right by the photo banner, fill out a connect card, turn that into our team, and they're going to give you a gift in return just for filling that out. And then I will be out there and I would love to get to know you and to welcome you to Christ Community Church. But before we dive into the Word of God today, we want to celebrate as we do every week. And I want to celebrate our Easter Sunday gathering last week. Um, It was incredible. I know that during our weekly prayer gathering on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., for many weeks we were praying and praying and praying that God would do something special on Easter, and He did. God responded, and God packed out His plate this place last week, and we had 10 people indicate that they desired to come to saving faith in Christ. And uh, yeah, go ahead. And uh, three of those people were children in Christ community kids. So praise the Lord. As we all know, as we hopefully know, we value the next generation here. We desire to see God use them and to see them soar and to see God moving in the lives of the young children here. It's absolutely beautiful. And solely Deo Gloria, all glory to God. Uh, I am thankful that he is growing his kingdom through what he is doing here at CCC. But something that we absolutely love here in America is comfort. We love to be comfortable. Um, let's look at some photos to show what I'm talking about. Talking about. So, yes, airplane neck pillows. Who of you have seen those before on an airplane? Who of you have used them on an airplane? I'll raise both my hands because they're comfortable. Uh, but we have to provide comfort for ourselves wherever life takes us. And who remembers the Snuggie phase? Who had a Snuggie? Admit it. Who had one? Oh, I saw Caden put your hand up and then down back there. Uh, I had I never owned a Snuggie, but they said that it was the ultimate comfort to keep you snug and warm. Now, I love uh, this next one right here. A good old extra large lazy boy recliner. There's nothing like taking a snap, a Sunday afternoon nap, in one of those bad boys right there. Um, I need that for the upcoming football season this fall. Uh, But that is the ultimate throne of comfort for dads everywhere. Then lastly, these bad boys right here, the Hoka shoes. If you own those, I promise I'm not making fun of you, okay? I promise. But shoes of the modern age provide more comfort than ever 
before. I've heard that these shoes are really comfortable. I've never owned a pair. I'm not sure how you could add any more padding on a shoe than what you see with the Hoka's. You see the disciples walked city to city in sandals, yet we need these for a 30 minute walk apparently in America. Uh, but, but not that any of these things are bad, but one thing is true about our culture is that our culture is on a never ending pursuit for comfort. We greatly seek out convenience and relaxation. I've heard it said before that America is no longer America the beautiful, but it's America the comfortable. And people act like they're going to die if they aren't able to go and sit and do nothing on a beach one week every six months of the out of the year. But my family, we, we rarely also, we rarely go to the movies, but I'll admit that now I don't want to go to the movie theater if the seats don't recline. I've been spoiled with really nice movie theaters. And I'm, if, if there's anyone from AMC Terre Haute that end up watching this or in here, please update your seats to reclining seats. I'm begging you. But on this never-ending pursuit of comfort, when discomfort comes, many people don't know how to act. And unfortunately, the pursuit of comfort has carried over to the American church. I truly believe that one of the biggest problems in the American church is that we are too comfortable. Our worldly comfort has caused us to lose track of the mission that Christ gave us. It's in the, it's in the way that we quickly complain when a gathering has gone five minutes too long. It's in the way that only 10% of Christians share their faith with others. It's in the way that so many pastors around the nation are scared to confront tough biblical issues because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or cause people to get uncomfortable in the pews. It's in the way that so many people sit on their gifts and talents and resources that God gifted them with because they don't want to be inconvenienced with serving or giving or being generous, which Christ has called each of us to do. And lastly, it's in the way that we center our prayers. When we pray, our prayers are so often self-centered. Our prayers are quite frequently about God removing obstacles in front of us to make things in our faith journey more comfortable. So often when we pray, our prayers are all about making our lives easier. Philip Brooks once said, don't pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Friends, it's time to get uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. And you see, the problem is not having comfort. The problem is what we find comfort from. We find comfort from playing it safe. We find comfort from avoiding opposition. We find comfort by avoiding any sort of conflict. We find comfort by staying in our spiritual comfort zones. We're afraid of trials. We're afraid of affliction. We're afraid of difficulty. So what do we do? We try to pray these things away. And like we've continued to see with the early church, as we get after it for the expansion of the kingdom of God, trials, affliction, and opposition are going to come. But God can bring us true comfort in the midst of all that. And it's not by praying those things away. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. So this verse, did it say that He takes away the affliction? No, it said He comforts us in all our affliction. And notice that despite affliction, despite suffering, despite opposition that we would so often call discomfort, Christ can bring us true comfort. And when I say it's time for us to get uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel, I'm saying that we need to stop finding comfort from things of this world. I'm saying that we must stop playing it safe in our mission from God to get after it and to work to expand the kingdom of God by preaching the gospel. Our comfort should not come from never sharing the gospel. Our comfort should come from Jesus Christ as we step out of our worldly comfort zones and get after it 
the expansion of the kingdom of God in this world. And we're in the middle of our verse-by-verse expedition through the book of Acts. And in this book, we are seeing how the capital C Church of Jesus Christ began and how this book should show us that it's time to get after it and to be a church in motion. And today, as we read, we're going to be diving into Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. And two weeks ago, uh, before on Palm Sunday, before Easter Sunday, we saw the religious leaders that Peter and John <laughs> preached the gospel to perplexed that these ordinary men were speaking so boldly and they eventually released them and set them free. Today, we're going to see Peter and John go back to their companions of the early church and tell them all that transpired in the temple and that we will see the early church come together for a united, unified prayer. And what we learn is that as we get after it for the expanding of the kingdom of God and opposition comes, Our prayers should not be focused on worldly comfort. Our prayers should be focused on asking God for perseverance and boldness despite whatever uncomfortable things we might face for the sake of the gospel being spread. This is our big idea today. We must not pray for worldly comfort. We must pray for perseverance and boldness to continue the king's mission in this world. I want to ask ourselves a question. Are your prayers focused on your own comfort or are your prayers focused on expanding the kingdom of God no matter the cost? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you that as your church, we get to gather together. And God, we know that you are here in our midst. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move amongst the people of God today. As we dive into the truth of your word, would you reveal truth to us. And God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of this word today, but God, that we would be doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, all right, let's dive back into Acts chapter 4, verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders has said to them. So here we see Peter and John, they were released. And the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish council of 71 people, release them from their captivity of them. And now you have to think, this was the world before digital technology. So there were no smartphones, there were no news stations. The trial of Peter and John was not live streamed on YouTube for everyone to see. Peter and John were not able to text their companions live updates of what was going on with the Sanhedrin. Uh, I know so often when I have a big meeting, uh, Madison will tell me, you better text me updates. Any husbands ever have that with their wife? But that wasn't possible for Peter and John. So imagine the anxiousness of the companions of Peter and John. That They hadn't heard from them and probably knew from word of mouth that they were under trial with the Jewish council. We go crazy and we get all anxious if our family and friends don't text us back in five minutes. But imagine the excitement that Peter and John had when they were released. Because they were excited because Peter and John had good news to report. We can picture them saying, we got to tell the religious leaders that put Jesus to death about the resurrection of Jesus. That also, the religious leaders told us that we were like Jesus. And they also told us not to tell anyone about Jesus, but through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we had boldness to step up and say, no, we will not stop telling people about Jesus. They had much good news to bring to the early church. And this verse finished and said that Peter and John went to their own people, which was their companions in the early church, and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So Peter and John, full of what I'm sure was was excitement, came to their companions, who I'm sure were anxiously awaiting them, and told them everything that had happened. And, And there's something here that we can learn, is Peter and John... They didn't go off alone. They didn't isolate themselves. You see, the early church lived in true community with one another. And as we get after it for the expansion of the kingdom of God, as we get out of our comfort zones and opposition comes, we must remain unified as a church and know that we are not alone. While the world may oppose us, the church is meant to be a place where we can receive guidance, as we see in Acts 2.42, encouragement, which we see in Hebrews 10.25, kindness, which we see in Ephesians 4.32, and comfort, 
which we see in 2 Corinthians 1.4. We should receive all of this from each other. But our, our discomfort in this world should not come from brothers and sisters in Christ attacking each other and bringing each other down. Our discomfort should come from stepping out of our comfort zones for the sake of the gospel. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should come together as we get out of our comfort zones to spread the gospel. And we should seek God. We should build one another up. And we should allow God and our fellow community of believers to bring us guidance, encouragement, kindness, and comfort in the face of opposition. Just like we're seeing with Peter and John in this passage today, we must be there for one another through all of the trials, sufferings, and opposition we may face. And as we do this, as Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ will bring us true spiritual comfort. Peter and John did not isolate themselves. They went back to the early church and they came together and we should learn from that, that we can never isolate ourselves in our spiritual journey. But let's see what the early church did. Their, their first response, right? In verse 24. Verse 24 says, When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. So this verse starts with, when they heard this. So this means that they heard Peter and John's report and then they raised their voices together to God and said. So after all the companions of Peter and John heard this report, the first thing they did after hearing about the threats from the Sanhedrin was to go to the Lord in prayer. The early church was showing us that prayer must be our first response, not our last resort. In our prayer, in, in, in our lives, prayer must always be our first response. When something good happens, we should go to the Lord in prayer and give Him thanks. When something bad happens, we should go to the Lord and ask for guidance and peace. Prayer has been put on the back burner in the lives of so many believers for far too long. And notice, they raised their voices, what? Together. They were unified. There was no discord. There was no hostility among them. And what we are about to see is a united prayer meeting with the early church. The people were of one heart and one mind. Division in the church always hinders prayer and robs the church of spiritual power. We must be unified as a church and we must always go to God in prayer as our first response, not our last resort. The early church experienced powerful moves of God because they were united in prayer. And as they began their prayer, they started with what? Master. And this title ascribes absolute authority, rule, and sovereignty to God. These early believers were reminding themselves that God was in control of all things as they continued with, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. They were acknowledging that although they had just been before the highest authority in the land, that the Lord was God, and He was the one that was over all. And they knew that He was the one that was worthy of the highest adoration and submission. And we must make sure that when we pray, we don't forget who it is we are praying to. We must pray to the God of the Bible, not an imaginary God of our own ideas. The early church had power in prayer because they knew who it was they were praying to. They were praying to the sovereign God of the entire universe. And we'll see that what they were praying was biblically guided prayers to the one true biblical God. Let's go ahead and dive back into verse 25. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? So here we see these uh, 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 early church believers immediately respond with prayer. And look what they did. To guide their prayer, they turned to Scripture. What they're about to pray is found in Psalms chapter 2. And notice how they started. I love this. With You said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of of our father David, your servant. So the you is referring to God. So you, God, said through the Holy Spirit. 
And what did God say and do through the Holy Spirit? He spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant. So God spoke through the Holy Spirit to David, and then David wrote Psalms chapter 2. The early church is making it clear that Scripture was inspired by God in this statement. Scripture is completely true and is the inspired Word of God even though it comes through flawed men like David. David failed. David was not perfect. But every word in this book is true because it was inspired by God through the power of the Holy Spirit and it was written by His servants through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Everything in this book is true. And we see that the early church, they held the Scriptures in high regard. And their prayers were based on the Word of God. The Word of God in prayer must always work together. In His Word, God speaks to us and tells us what He wants us to do. Now in prayer, we speak to Him and make ourselves available to accomplish His will. True prayer is not telling God what to do, but asking God to do His will in us and through us. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says, this is the confidence we have before Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. God wants us to see and to discern His will through His Word, and to pray His will into action. And you may ask, if God, if something is God's will, why doesn't He just do it? Like, why do we even have to pray about it? 2 Corinthians 6.1 says, working together with Him. Friends, God wants us to work with Him, and that means bringing our plans into alignment with His. For example, Parents with young children, right? When you're, when you're cooking a home cooked meal and one of your kids wants to help cook the meal, do we really need the help of the kids? No, no, no. More often than not, having kids help with the meal makes it more difficult. You normally have more of a mess to clean up. You have to do a lot more talking and it makes the process go even longer. But as a loving parent, you love to make them a part of the process because it brings you both together. And friends, we are in a relationship with a loving Father, and He wants us to care about the things that He cares about. And He wants us to care about them enough to pray passionately about them. And prayer is also not simply casting wishes to heaven. God is not our magic genie in a bottle. Our prayer must be rooted in understanding God's will and promises according to His Word and praying those promises into action. The early church did not try to pray to have their circumstances changed or their enemies, the big bad guys, put out of office. Rather, they asked God to empower them and to make the best use of their circumstances and to accomplish what He had planned. And all of this is exactly what the early church is doing in these verses today. So after acknowledging that God was the one who inspired David to write the words of Psalms 2, they continued in verse 25 and began their quotation of Psalms 2 that said, why do the Gentiles rage and people's plot futile things? David in the psalm was writing about how people of the earth don't want to submit to God's sovereignty. And this was the perfect psalm for the early church to have guiding their prayers because they were directly facing the works done by evil men. They they were facing uncomfortable opposition and as they got after it for the expansion of the kingdom of God, they were dealing with people that did not want to submit to the plan of God. And from God's word in Psalm 2, they knew that this opposition would come. But they didn't need to get all worked up even though they were facing some worldly discomfort. They didn't need to get all worried. They didn't need to get all fearful. Why? Because God was in control of all things. The early church knew and understood that God makes His plans and God sets rulers in their places to make His plan come to pass. And they continued in the next verse 
with a, uh, continuing the quotation of Psalms 2. So let's dive back to verse 26. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. So David, in the psalm that the early church was quoting, started with the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together. Throughout the history of all mankind, men have tried assembling themselves together against God. The terms kings and rulers are not just two specific groups, but they represent all governing authorities on the earth. And they said, they came together and they, and they said that they, they take their stand against the Lord and against his Messiah. So these rulers both oppose the Lord God Almighty and his Messiah, who is Jesus. And David in Psalms 2 predicted that there would be rulers of the earth that assembled together in defiance of the Messiah being Jesus. And the early church is quoting the psalm because they knew that this prediction from David was coming to pass. Rulers of the earth were doing all that they could to combat the sovereign plan of God. We see this next in, in, in verse 27. For in fact, in the city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. So this verse started with, for in fact, the early church was applying the message of Psalms 2 to their own situation and identified that their current adversaries were Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of of Israel. And what did these rulers do? Exactly what Psalms 2 said they would do. They were taking their stand against the Messiah. And we see this in our culture today. People continue time and time again to try to take their stand against Jesus, the King of Kings. They assemble together against the holy servant of Jesus. And, and these enemies, they had their plans. They assembled together. They felt like they were powerful. They felt like they could dethrone the sovereign God. And the early church was surrounded by evil leaders that desired to dethrone the sovereign God. They were surrounded by earthly rulers that thought they could dethrone God. They were surrounded by rulers that made things uncomfortable for them. And in his word, God told his people beforehand that the nations would conspire against the Messiah, that all these leaders would try to do everything in their power to oppose God, his Messiah Jesus, and his church. And you know what God does in response to all these threats from these earthly rulers? The early church didn't quote the rest of Psalms uh, 2, but two verses later, in Psalms 2-4, we see what the Lord does. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. One of the most embarrassing and humiliating things that a person can do to someone that is attempting to act tough is to laugh in their face at their attempts to look tough. I'm not a huge follower of UFC, which is the ultimate fighting uh, championship, MMA, but one of my favorite fighters was George St. Pierre known as GSP. Has anyone watched a fight with GSP before? He, I still love GSP. He's awesome. He, he was an absolute animal in the ring. And in 2017, he fought against a guy named Michael Bisping. And if you know anything about UFC, you know that before their fight, they weigh in, they have to meet weight, and then they do a quick stare down, and, and, and then they go off before their fight. Well, GSP and Bisping, they did their weigh in, and then they started their little stare off. And you see Bisping immediately start to talk smack, start to try to charge through to GSP, pointing fingers, and he was trying to act all tough. And you know what GSP did? Let's look at this photo. GSP, on the right, laughed. I put shirts on them because we're in church, okay? But GSP was laughing at the threats by Bisping. And this is what got, and you know who won the fight? GSP not the guy that was making all the threats. And this is what God does. God looks at the ones that try to oppose him and he laughs. God is not afraid when man attempts to oppose him. God isn't intimidated by depraved men that plot against him and his church. God doesn't get all worried when earthly rulers try to belittle him. God laughs at it. God doesn't get confused. 
God doesn't get depressed. God doesn't get all anxious. No, God laughs. God laughs because He is in the heavens. He sits as the King of all. He isn't anxiously pacing back and forth through the hallways of heaven, getting all worked up over the depravity that evil men conjure up. No, no, He doesn't do that. God sits in total control and laughs. He's not anxiously roaming the halls of heaven trying to figure out what He needs to do. God laughs because His plans and His purposes will come to pass. And we can either try to dethrone or try to oppose the sovereign God, or we can get all worked up over all the evil plans that all these big bad guys are planning in our world, or we can join God in holy laughter. When laws get passed that are anti-God, we can go to the Lord in prayer and laugh along with Him knowing that His ultimate plan is going to come to pass. There's absolutely nothing better in life then when you can join with those close to you in just laughter, right? Like when you're sitting around the table with, with family and friends eating dinner and you all just join together in laughter. And friends, we can look at the, the world and we can either get all worked up, we can get all fearful, we can get all anxious, or we can trust in the sovereignty of God, know that he has a plan, and join in laughter knowing that the plans of these evil men are only going to work to accomplish his ultimate purpose. When we face oppression for our faith, we can look at those that oppose us and laugh because God is sovereign. God has the final say and no person and no thing will ever be able to defeat him. And the early church knew this. This truth was guiding their prayers. They knew that despite the discomfort that they were facing here on earth, they knew that what was happening was all a part of God's plan. And just a quick note, the early church strongly believed in God's sovereignty and His perfect plan for His people, but note, they did not permit their faith in God's sovereignty to destroy human responsibility. They remained faithful in prayer and witnessing. And I love the quote from Augustine. He once said, pray as though everything depends on God and work as though everything depended on you. Now let's look at what the early church Continued to pray in verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. The early church knew that what had happened with Jesus was all a part of the predestined plan of God. They knew that these evil men opposing God, Jesus, and the church was all a part of God's plan. God was doing whatever his hand and his will had predestined to take place. And because the early church saw their circumstances in light of God's word, they were able to recognize that the wrath of man never operated outside of the realm of God's control. These enemies of Jesus could only do whatever the hand of God allowed. And knowing this should bring us comfort. We can know that whatever comes our way is not out of the realm of God's control. And in their prayer in this passage today, it should show us that, 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 that the opposition we might face or the discomfort we have to endure is entirely under God's sovereignty and it is according to His plan. And we're about to see that the early church isn't going to ask God to keep them from opposition. The, the early church isn't going to ask God to remove these evil leaders that were making things hard for them. The other church is going to ask God to take away their struggles so that they can live their comfy Christian lives on their spiritual couches of laziness. No. Let's look at what the early church prayed in verse 29. And now, Lord, consider their threats. <laughs> this is so powerful. And grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. So these believers look to the Lord and said, consider their threats. When they say consider, they're asking the Lord to hear the threats of the ones that are coming against them. And look at this. They did not ask for protection. They did not ask God to remove the big bad guys from their position. They did not ask God to take away their discomfort. No, they asked God to grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. 
Remember our big idea today. We must not pray for worldly comfort. We must pray for perseverance and boldness to continue the king's mission in the world. And this prayer from the earlier church was not focused on their comfort. Their great desire was for boldness in the face of opposition. And so often, our prayers differ from what we see within the early church in this passage today. And I unfortunately believe that our prayers are often affected and guided by the quote-unquote American dream ideology versus the Word of God. What if, what if when we prayed for those that are, are, are facing opposition or are experiencing suffering, that instead of ju- just praying, God, we decree and declare in the name of Jesus that you alleviate this. What if we continued and said, but Lord, if you choose not to, may the gospel advance because of this struggle. The, the great desire of the early church was not that they, that even if they should suffer, that, that God would Their desire was that if they should suffer, that God would give them boldness so that the gospel could be spread. That even if they should receive threats, that God would give them power. That they weren't asking for comfort. They were asking God for perseverance for the mission that He called them to. And my friends, we're in a race of faith. And it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a pilgrimage. And the race is tiresome. The race, it's not easy. But just like we see the early church here in Acts experiencing, there's going to be times throughout this race where we are huffing and puffing and suffering to get through. There's going to be parts of this race where we're running towards Jesus and people stand on the sidelines in their seats of worldly comfort and throw fiery darts against us to oppose us and to wear us down. And Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3.12, In fact, all, say it with me, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not some, all. And on this race of faith, suffering, persecution, and opposition are unavoidable for the Christian. But we must not give up. We must not throw up the white flag. We must not disqualify ourselves from the race. No, we must run with endurance. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Keeping our eyes on what? Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We must run with endurance. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. And in our prayers, we cannot ask God to remove us from this race that is uncomfortable and allow us to sit on the sidelines on a comfortable padded seat of spiritual laziness. No, we must pray and ask God, God, even though there are those that are opposing me, even though that I'm enduring things that are difficult, even though the world opposes the message of the gospel that you've called me to preach, will you please grant that your servant may speak your word with all boldness? The mission of Jesus is worth more than our lives and is more important than having worldly comfort. So let's pray prayers where we ask God to grant us the power to move forward on this mission from Him with all boldness and all power. And in this race, there's a cross to bear. Jesus died on the cross for us, not that we may escape it, but that we may endure it. Jesus told us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus said to His disciples, if anyone wants to follow after Me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. And this isn't something, if you guys know, if you've been coming here, I'm not going to preach things that people want to hear. I'm going to preach the truth of the word. But Jesus did not suffer to exclude our suffering on on this earth. He did not do that. Jesus died on the cross 
not that we may escape suffering, but so that we may endure it for a purpose. Christ sets us free from the power of sin, but not from temporary sorrows on this earth. But in the words of the great Charles Spurgeon, when you are persecuted for your devotion, when your religion brings a trial of cruel mockery upon you, remember it is not your, it is not on your cross. It is Christ. And it is a delight to carry the cross of our Lord Jesus. This race, this cross we carry, these persecutions, the fiery darts from the enemies of Christ, this worldly discomfort, they are all temporary. And if we will endure and ask God for boldness and perseverance in our prayers, God will grant them unto us and we can run this race with endurance and there will be a day when we reach the celestial city when our race is complete and God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Friends, do not get, give up. If things are hard right now, do not give up. Like we see with the early church in this passage today, let's trust in God's sovereignty. Let's not be focused on our worldly comfort. Let's pray prayers that align with the Word of God and His will. And let's ask God to give us boldness and perseverance to preach this gospel. He's called us to a mission and we must endure no matter how uncomfortable it might be. Let's dive back in and see how the church continued their prayer in verse 30. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So here in verse 30, this is a continuation of their prayer in verse 29. They ask God in verse 29, as we just read, grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. And then there is a comma, and they continue with, while you stretch out your hand for healing. So God, as you grant your servants to speak with word, the, your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They were not asking God to just perform miracles through themselves. They knew that Jesus heals and performs signs and wonders and does all of these things when he desires to work through his church. But they were praying for God to work these miracles. They, they were praying for God to perform healing signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. And what we see with the early church is that they wanted to glorify Jesus through all these signs and wonders. It was Jesus that gave them boldness to preach the gospel, and it was Jesus that performed the miracles through them. And it was His name that deserved the glory. And it's important to remember this. The glory of God is the highest purpose of an, an, of an, uh, ugh, of an answered prayer. The glory of God. That's the highest purpose of an answered prayer. Now in verse 30, they finish their prayer. Let's see what happens next in verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God boldly. So after they had prayed, God answered by shaking the place where they were assembled. God gave them this earthquake like just happened in New York City to express His pleasure with their prayers. I'm not saying that the earthquake happened in New York City to show New York that God was honoring what they're doing as a city. That's not what I'm saying. But here in verse 31, God gave them this to express His pleasure with their prayers. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the third time now, the third time in our expedition in Acts where we have seen Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at our moment of conversion, but in our race of faith, God will fill us with more and more of His Spirit to help us endure the race before us. We must continually be filled with more and more of God's Spirit. Like some of you to get through the day, you need to be filled with more and more cups of coffee and caffeine. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is what gave the early church boldness to continue the king's mission, as the verse finished with, to speak the word of God boldly. Church, can that be our goal? That despite whatever we're going through, despite whatever temporary sufferings or opposition we may be facing, that we would desire for God to empower us to preach the Word of God boldly. In the name of Jesus, they received the boldness from God they asked for. And as we prepare to close, I want to ask ourselves, why are we, and I want to add in, why are we 
and the capital C Church of America not seeing a move of the Holy Spirit like we see in the book of Acts? Is it because we're more concerned about our comfort? Are we more concerned about our reputation than about Christ and the mission that He has called us to do? Are we more interested in gaining new toys and gadgets and seeing the gospel be powerfully proclaimed and embraced by those in our community that so desperately need it? The Holy Spirit that filled the early church is the same Holy Spirit inside each follower of Christ in this room today. And the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us. God has not lost His power. But many of God's people have lost their power because they have stopped praying to the sovereign God. Dr. R.A. Torrey once said, pray for great things, expect great things, work for great things, but above all, pray. And I want to ask ourselves, do we have an active prayer life? And if you do, are you praying for comfort or are you praying for boldness and perseverance to continue the king's mission? You can stand to your feet. So we've made it through Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31, and we saw the early church come together for a unified prayer. And hopefully what we've learned today is that as we get after it for the expanding of the kingdom of God and opposition comes, which it will, as we know, is promised to us in his word, our prayer should not be focused on worldly comfort. Our prayers should be focused on asking God for perseverance and boldness despite whatever uncomfortable things we might face for the sake of the gospel being spread. So let's get uncomfortable. Let's get after it in our prayers so that we are empowered for the mission from the King. And a little plug in here. Join us for prayer this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So today you, you may be someone in here that, that needs to pray to God to save your soul. Listen, if you have not come to saving faith in Christ, we preach about this last week at Easter, you are bound by death. You are a son of Adam. Death is your inheritance. But Christ died to set you free from the power of death. And He can set you free today. Uh, you, you may not be in a relationship with God through Jesus right now, but I want you to know that He can save you today. Romans 10.13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you desire to call on the name of Jesus to be saved, I encourage you during our time of of prayer here in just a moment to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Just talk to Him. Repent of your sins, meaning that you're telling God that you desire to turn away from the sin that separated you from Him. And declare that Christ is Lord and you will be saved. And today, um, we're going to, actually today is the first Sunday of the month, so we're going to take communion. So I invite our communion team up at this time. Um, But I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to, if you were here on Good Friday, we're going to take communion pretty in a pretty similar way. Um, We invite everyone up to walk through the sides to come up and to gather your elements and then walk back through the middle aisles to get back to your seat. And then um, don't take your communion yet. We're going to read some scripture and we're going to take communion together. And then uh, after we take communion, we're going to go in our time of one last song and prayer. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I pray for those in this room that have not came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would draw them unto you today. And God, I pray that this would be a day of conversion for many people in this room, Lord. And God, I pray that as we get after it, that we would not pray for worldly comfort, that we would pray for perseverance and boldness to continue the King's mission in this world. God, I pray that we would be willing to get uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. God, I pray, Lord, that as a church, we would be there for one another through all the trials, sufferings, and opposition we may face. And God, I pray that prayer would be our first response, not our last resort. And God, I pray that we would not view you as our magic genie in a bottle, but that we would ask you, Lord, to do your will in us and through us. And God, I pray that we would trust in your sovereignty. God, I pray that we would not be focused on worldly comfort. And God, I pray that we would pray prayers that align with the Word of God and Your will. And God, that You would give us boldness to preach the Gospel. And God, I pray that we would endure this race no matter how uncomfortable it might be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Well, that wraps up our sermon this week. We hope that you enjoyed. If you're in need of prayer, you can email me at pastor at christcommunitychurch.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram at mycccbrazil. We pray that you have a great week.